we have this conversation about how everyone is over fat and obesity is an issue, which yes, it inevitably is an issue. But the reality is, is if we are really thinking about longevity and longevity can be defined as in terms of length of time, but there's a concept of really health span and the way in which you live right? The quality of one's life. And that arguably, from my opinion, obviously, as a trained geriatrician is all about skeletal muscle. When we think about muscle, we think about the site of glucose disposal. Everybody's talking about carbohydrates. When you eat, you know, where does it go? Glucose is, is certainly toxic to all cells and has to be removed from the bloodstream. And the site for glucose disposal is skeletal muscle. And that, that's just one uh, of the many benefits of skeletal muscle. Of course, lipid oxidation. You hear a lot of talk about fatty acids and triglycerides. Well, um, skeletal muscle is a large site just based on its weight of fatty acid oxidation. And then of course, amino acid reserve. If you fall, you wanna make sure that you are protected. So skeletal muscle not only protects you as your body armor, but if you were not able to work out or if you were injured or if there was some other aspect of your life where you could no longer train, then skeletal muscle is going to be that site of amino acid reserve. Amino acid profiles are different in animal-based products versus plant-based products. They're, they are not the same. This is, you know, it's a not emotional topic. It's just purely based on amino acid profiles can they still meet their protein needs? It's possible, it's certainly plausible, it can be done. Obviously the liver king, it's gonna be much easier for him versus a vegan or vegetarian style eating plan. You know, I am certainly concerned about the qualities of protein. And then, especially if you're vegan or vegetarian, I'm also concerned about the amount of carbohydrates that go in conjunction with that. My secondary concern is nutrient quality. You know, you're talking about bioavailable iron, you're talking about omega, you are talking about calcium, you're talking about B vitamins, creatine. These are things that are not, you know, creatine is not found in plants. So I, I do wonder why, if that was per se a more advantageous way of eating, why all the nutrients wouldn't exist, mm -hmm. right? Why would an individual have to go to tremendous lengths to counterbalance whatever deficiencies may be there. But I believe with these conversations of uh, steering away from animal-based products is that we are going to see an epidemic of osteoporosis because the data is very clear that calcium, vitamin D, K2, uh, weight-bearing exercises, dietary protein are all profoundly important when it comes to, yes, skeletal muscle, but also bone. Uh, supplementation can certainly do it. I, I do think there is something to be said for a whole food matrix. When we begin to isolate foods and isolate pea proteins, there is estrogen-like activity that we don't know of the compounding effects because it's not found in nature. Could it be done in supplementation? Absolutely. Do I have some hesitancy towards creating a diet that is deeply supplemented with not necessarily necessarily whole foods. I, I do. I actually fundamentally don't care much about that. I'm much more interested in the quality of the protein at a fundamental level. Does it have the correct amino acids necessary? Does it have a certain amount of amino acids without a tremendous amount of calories? Could you get all your calories in protein uh, from quinoa? You can, but you're looking at a thousand calories versus 180. But in terms of quality, I don't think that someone should limit their consumption of animal-based or, you know, animal-based or fish products because it's not organic. A high protein diet could anywhere be above 30 to 35% would be considered high protein, probably closer to 50, 50. In the same, in the same way that when we go to the gym and we build muscle and like our bicep gets bigger, he was saying that similarly, when you eat a lot of protein, maybe the kidney becomes a little bit more inflamed, but in the sense that it's building like more of its muscle. muscle. I think that there's no evidence to support that you could one could have too much protein, right? It's really based on being able to dispose of the nitrogen and ammonia, you know, which ultimately becomes urea. We haven't seen data that, that there is a higher threshold of too much individuals can exist on multiple levels of, 
uh, protein intake. Some individuals do better with a higher protein intake like myself, um, but then the rest of my diet is carbohydrates. So I also really tolerate carbs, no problem. Nutrition science is very complicated because there's so many systems in place and there's so many factors. There are so, some core fundamentals that we have to springboard off of, right? And one of those core fundamentals is optimizing for protein first. It is a extremely satiating macronutrient. It affects gut hormones. It has a higher thermic effect of food, meaning it is expensive to utilize, dispose of. Protein is so important because it stimulates muscle protein synthesis. And that muscle protein synthesis mechanism is highly regarded, also extremely energy expensive. And that's one reason why protein is not easily stored. It is utilized. The body goes through protein turnover, whether it's 250 grams a day of protein turnover, if not higher, the body's constantly regenerating. The protein that you ingest goes through a process of breakdown and is important for gluconeogenesis, which is the generation of glucose, right? Which happens through the liver. And when protein is too high, you know, it, you do have to deal with those carbon, that carbon backbone. And yeah, of course you can certainly get out of uh, ketosis. I don't have concerns. I would say, depending on my training status, I have eaten upwards of 200 grams. Again, I think that we can continue to eat different ki kinds of diets and these diets can be cyclical in nature. If you are a woman, who is going through menopause or perimenopause, or you are an older adult, I strongly, strongly suggest that you utilize a protein forward diet and you optimize for dietary protein. During menopause, weight changes, typically mm -hmm. activity changes, you know, women go through hormonal changes and they do gain, a sub this is the time where they'll gain a substantial amount of weight. At this point, utilizing and leveraging protein as um, a macronutrient to prioritize for not only body composition, but satiation is, is really critical and also maintaining skeletal muscle mass. As you age, a higher protein diet is imperative. We actually need more protein as we age, not less. Muscle is the organ of longevity and regulates everything about your body and the trajectory of your health it becomes much more difficult to maintain as you age. The other component to that is if you are obese or are you are struggling with body composition issues, there is some evidence to suggest your tissues are more resistant to the anabolic effects, which is that growth effect of protein and exercise. Perimenopause, postmenopausal women optimizing for protein, older adults need to optimize for protein. And if you have body composition issues, typically, Again, some evidence would suggest that your tissue has more of a blunted response to muscle protein synthesis. I would start from a very baseline perspective, thinking about protein in a 24 hour cycle. One gram per pound ideal body weight will cover nearly everybody's needs. I am 115 pounds. I'm very tiny, I'm five foot one, as you, you mentioned. 115 to 120 grams of protein is, is per perfectly adequate for me. Could I go up or down? Totally. Now, the next thing is protein dosing. If you are anchoring your three meals a day in 30 grams of protein at a minimum, you can help correct for blood sugar regulation, right? You now can go through the process of gluconeogenesis where your body is generating its own glucose. It has a highly satiating effect you are able to stimulate muscle protein synthesis and it allows you to not get too hungry. So you're not having these ebbs and flows in cortisol and other counter regulatory hormones. The next strategy would be if you are looking really to optimize muscle mass. And to me, to optimize muscle mass, you want to push the higher protein lever and that would be 40 to 50, 55 grams in discrete meals. And that could be three to four meals a day. That would be a great strategy. If you are looking to just maintain, you could easily do two very robust protein meals, 55 grams or 50 grams with a smaller snack in between. And I don't really care about that protein 
intake as long as you're eating, you're meeting your 24 hour need. So those are a few strategies that anyone could do tomorrow. And I don't think that the one meal a day is a great strategy. We know that from the data. And again, this is a lot of data from Dr. Lehman's lab. He would also recommend that one meal a day would not likely be optimal for body composition. Besides, why would you, why would an individual uh, want to do that with the option of being able to perhaps utilize a different strategy, like at least one more meal. You cannot build muscle without exercise. I typically recommend at least three to four days a week of resistance exercise. You know, having a well-designed program is absolutely essential. You're not going to build muscle by sitting on the, the couch eating protein. That just doesn't happen. You need mechanical tension. You need some kind of metabolic stress. Of course, when you're young, and you're relatively untrained, you'll put on muscle much quicker. You have a, a more robust hormonal milieu. Uh, the other aspect of training, which I haven't had the opportunity to talk about is cardiovascular activity. I, I think that that is very valuable, not just high intensity interval training, but that zone to slower cardio training is very important for mitochondria function. But ideally 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity exercise is important. You know, zone two is not necessarily intense. It's a great place to start. And then at least one day a week, but doing that really max effort once a week is important. I do train legs three days a week and I do train legs heavy three days a week. I am relatively lean as an individual because I, I train my whole life. So I really focus on working on that lower body strength. And it's a lot of squats, a lot of uh, compound movements. And I go through cycles, you know, I've, I've used kettlebells and, and trained with kettlebells and one to two days just to maintain upper body strength of upper body, some kind of lift. And then typically I will be adding in another high intensity interval training day and a couple more cardiovascular days. Yeah, uh, no particular reason other than, um, you know, I'm, my upper body strength is good. I really would love to increase lower body strength and musculature.